am delighted to welcome you to this place to talk about religious freedom. And let that sink in just a moment. It is a wonderful thing to be talking about and, and such an uh, important place to us at the University of Virginia and I think to the nation. So I thank you for coming tonight. My name is Kathleen Flake and I'm the Richard Lyman Bushman Professor of Mormon Studies. Our event tonight is sponsored by the Religious Studies Department and its Mormon Studies program, as well as its Forum on Religion and Democracy. We are very grateful to the generous and far-sighted donors who make events like this possible, and very grateful to you for coming and making this a conversation. Tonight, I am privileged to introduce someone I consider a friend, one of those dear friends you never see enough, but you can still say we are friends. Uh, Dr. Katrina Lantos Sweat is president of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice. Established in 2008 in honor of her father, the late Congressman Tom Lantos. I think she would want me to tell you a little bit about her father, and I do so because I think it tells you a little bit about his daughter. Tom Lantos was a Hungarian Holocaust survivor who immigrated to America. He was a refugee. He retained the lessons of those early years throughout the 27 years he served in the Senate. He was known, as one of his colleagues said, for using his powerful voice to stir the conscience, the consciousness, excuse me, but also the conscience, of the world. Bono called him a prize fighter in protecting human rights and common decency. Katrina Lantos displays that same grit and power in the way she has led the Lantos Foundation and served in an impressive number of public commissions. So let me list some of them for you. She has twice been chair of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. She's vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Human Rights and also a leader on the Human Rights, uh, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. She's on the board of international, she's on the International Advisory Board for UN Watch and on the advisory board of the annual Anne Frank Award and Lecture. It also says something about her, particularly the keenness of her intellect, that Dr. Sweat earned a political science degree from Yale University at the age of 18. I'll let you do the math on when she entered Yale. And a degree from the University of California Hastings College of Law not long after. Clearly not one to let the grass grow on her feet, she turned her husband's stint as an ambassador into an opportunity to get a PhD from the University of Southern Denmark. Meanwhile, organizing in defense of uh, human sex workers and traffickers, is that right? Moreover, while living in Copenhagen, uh, oh, I did have this, she led a successful advocacy effort to convince the Danish government to take action against illicit trafficking of women and children through Denmark. Later, she would go on to run for Congress and co-host the highly regarded political talk show, Beyond Politics. She teaches human rights and American foreign policy at Tufts University. And if that isn't making you feel like enough of a slacker, she is generally and frequently a consultant to businesses, charitable foundations, and political campaigns, all in the interest of human rights and common decency. Tonight, the particular human rights she speaks to is that of human conscience and its corollary, religious liberty. Specifically, she speaks to our present context, the context of religious radicalism, to examine the threat it poses to religious liberty. I give you Katrina Lantos, my friend. Good evening. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here with you in Charlottesville for the third annual Joseph Smith Religious Liberty Lecture. I cannot help but be mindful of this moment in the life of this beautiful and historic community. It was just a few weeks ago that both a tragedy and a travesty occurred in your community and I can only imagine that these events still weigh heavily on everyone's minds. And although my remarks tonight are not directly about the events that unfolded here, the themes of radicalization 
and the interplay of liberty, religion, and tolerance will perhaps, I hope, yield some insights relevant to the healing and learning taking place in your hometown. Now let me begin tonight with a confession, which is an undertaking frequently encouraged for people of faith, and I am a person of faith. I am absolutely passionate about the subject of freedom of religion, conscience, and belief, and I make no apologies for that fact. During the four years that I served as a member, as vice chair and chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, I came to appreciate more deeply than I had before how essential this bedrock human right is, not only to our individual sense of dignity and integrity, but to our civic diversity and flourishing. So I'm really very excited to have a chance to talk about these ideas with you tonight. And, of course, the opportunity to address this topic at Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia in this magnificent, beautiful, inspiring venue. Um, and for the occasion to be the Joseph Smith Religious Liberty Lecture, well, honestly, it's almost too good to be true. After all, it was Thomas Jefferson who gave us the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, the forerunner of our First Amendment, and a powerful statement of the principles of both freedom of conscience and the separation of church and state. It was Jefferson who said, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. And less well known, but quite important to me, it was Thomas Jefferson who helped play Cupid to my budding romance with the man who has now been my husband for nearly 40 years, since one of our first very serious dates, I mean, you know, moving past the hi, how are you dates, um, took place at the Jefferson Memorial in DC, where those very words are inscribed. And I should mention parenthetically that Thomas Jefferson has always had a, a rather special place in our family's um, admiration and lore because uh, he was an architect statesman, an architect public servant, and my husband was the only architect to serve in Congress in the 20th century, um, and also tall and handsome, so, you know, I always felt like there was kind of something going on there. <laughs> um, and then there is Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the Latter-day Saint Church, who had a profound, theologically grounded devotion to the idea of religious freedom. He enshrined it as one of the articles of faith of that community where it states, we claim the privilege of worshiping almighty God according to the dictates of our conscience and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. Joseph made this commitment very personal when he said in 1843, I am ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any denomination, for the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the Latter-day Saints would trample upon the rights of the Roman Catholics or of any other denomination who may be unpopular and too weak to defend themselves. It is a love of liberty which inspires my soul, civil and religious liberty to the whole of the human race. So truly tonight, I feel I am in the perfect place to talk about something I hold so near and dear to my heart. I want to start by sharing two stories, one historical and one very, very personal, that I think illustrate the different but complementary ways in which freedom of conscience is important to us as individuals and to the societies we inhabit. First, let's look at a big picture from history. A few years ago, I traveled to Berlin to participate in the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's 10-year anniversary conference, examining the problem of anti-Semitism in the EU, which, as I'm sure many of you know, has seen an alarming rise in recent years. It was a sobering and, in many ways, a very discouraging conference. But an experience I had while there also reinforced my conviction that history is not kind to, nor does it ultimately reward those who trample on the religious rights and freedoms of others. 
This truth was vividly underscored while I was on a brief tour of Berlin during a break from the conference. I was struck by the comment of the tour guide that when the Edict of Nantes was revoked in 1685, thousands of persecuted Huguenots fled from France to the city of Berlin, where they started many of the industries and trades that ended up becoming the backbone of that region's economy. Now, when I give this speech, I like to say, you will recall that the Edict of Nantes, but of course, most people in my audience really don't recall much about the Edict of Nantes. Anybody here want to you know, pop up and share with us about the history of the Edict of Nantes? And just to make you feel a little better, when I went on the tour, I rushed back to the hotel to look up a little more about the Edict of Nantes because I was not entirely up on my French history either. But the Edict of Nantes was signed in 1598 by Henry IV of France, and it had granted to the Calvinist Huguenots substantial rights in a nation that was overwhelmingly Catholic. This was a break from the long-standing tradition that the religion of the ruler of a nation would determine the religion of those he ruled. It was well summed up in the Latin phrase, cuius regio, eius religio, whose realm, his religion. One might view the Edict of Nantes as an early advancement of the right to freedom of religion, and therefore its revocation was a huge step backwards. But the key point I want to make is that by driving the Huguenots out of their land, it was the French who suffered economically and in other ways, and the community that gave them refuge benefited. I don't think it is too much of a stretch to see some powerful analogies to the controversies of today regarding refugees and immigrants seeking to come to our country. And as Kathleen mentioned, my parents were two such refugees and immigrants. But to circle back to the key point that I want to emphasize, it is that protecting religious liberty is not just the right thing to do. It is almost always, in the long run, the smart thing for a society to do as well. The second story is much more personal, and it is from the life of my father, Tom Lantos. As was mentioned, he was the only survivor of the Holocaust ever elected to serve in the United States Congress, and he rose to become not only the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, but more importantly to me, he was the founder of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus and one of our nation's most forceful and eloquent advocates for human rights. He was a young Jewish teenager in 1944 when the Germans occupied his native Hungary. Hungary had, to that point, been a German ally, but Germany feared that it was on the brink of switching allegiances, which was true, and so it became an occupied territory. The German occupation began the true nightmare for the Jews of Hungary, and ultimately, some 500,000 Hungarian Jews lost their lives during the horrors of that time. My dad, like thousands of other Jewish boys, was rounded up and sent to a slave labor camp outside of the capital of Budapest, where he was conscripted into forced labor under brutal conditions. He rarely spoke of this time, but many years later, his closest companion, who survived the slave battalion as well, shared this story from those very dark days. The Hungarian commander of my father's labor group decided to burnish his reputation by compelling all the Jewish boys in his barracks to be baptized. They were frightened. They were essentially helpless and at his mercy. So they all complied, except for two, my father and his friend, Nori Kerenyi. They were very badly beaten for their refusal, and yet they did not comply. Now, from what I know of my father back then, he was not an especially religious teenager, although in the very few letters that survive from that time, he did write about his belief in God, 
a belief that would, over time, give way to a more skeptical agnosticism. But I don't think it was so much his religiosity that made him refuse to be baptized against his will, as it was his recognition that his inherent and inalienable right to possess his own soul was at stake, and he was prepared to pay a high price to defend it. Something within that young boy intuitively understood that if he were to allow this trampling upon his conscience, he would lose something of inestimable value. I like to think that the character of my father, the character my father eventually developed, that made him such a brave and such a bold defender of the rights of others, began in that moment when he chose his integrity and his dignity over his own safety. So freedom of religion, conscience, and belief matters a lot. It is crucial to building people and communities of character. And there can be little doubt that today, this precious right is in peril in many places around the world. And in places where religious freedom is in peril, a whole basket of other cherished fundamental rights are also at risk. It is no accident that religious freedom is often called the first freedom. This is not merely because of its prominent place as the first freedom in the First Amendment in our Bill of Rights, but because it is the wellspring from which so many other of our revered freedoms flow. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, the equal protection of law. I think a strong argument can be made that each one of these pillars of a democratic, tolerant, pluralistic society is anchored in the bedrock protection of religious freedom. And in fact, a growing body of social science research bears this out. Studies by the Pew Foundation and others have found a strong correlation between the robust protection of religious freedom and the flourishing of other social goods, such as stability, prosperity, democracy, and interestingly, and from my point of view, quite importantly, higher socioeconomic status for women. And yet, and yet, for all the ways in which we can see that religious freedom is an enormous benefit to society, there is a counter narrative that we cannot ignore. The purpose of religious freedom is to give people the widest possible latitude to live out their lives according to the dictates of their own conscience. And that sounds pretty good. But what if their convictions, what if their pursuit of religious virtue leads towards intolerance, towards claims of religious supremacy, and yes, even to religiously motivated violence? This is no mere idle speculation. Just a very quick mental review of the last 12 months of terror attacks around the world confirms that the majority of them are motivated by radical religious extremists who justify unspeakable acts of violence in the name of their devotion to God. How can this be? Has it something to do with the nature of religion itself, or is it our human nature that is to blame? Religion, particularly religions based on revealed truth, like the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and most certainly the restored Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a, a church founded on this concept of revelation. They make the highest and most audacious claims imaginable, namely that the truths they teach have been imparted directly from God. That is the ultimate trump card, is it not? In the words of an old Texas preacher, it turns out everyone wants a theocracy and everyone wants to be Theo. That, my friends, can be a real problem. 
I am reminded of a freewheeling game of rock, paper, scissors that I observed two of my children playing many years ago when they were quite little. Now, probably most of you know the game of rock, paper, scissors. You have your hands behind your back, you count to three, and on the count of three, you have to come forward with your hand either in the shape of a rock, a paper, or a scissor. And each one of those items can potentially trump the other. So if you have paper, paper covers rock. You win that round. If you have a scissor, the scissor cuts paper. You win the round. If you have a rock and a scissor, the rock breaks the scissor and the rock wins that round. And they were having a lot of fun playing rock, paper, scissors. But they decided to spice up the game by letting them pull out anything at all um, from behind their back after the count of three. There were cries of tigers and tanks and all sorts of very imaginative things. And as you can imagine, the arms race escalated with each round as the kids tried to outdo one another in coming up with an unbeatable, you know, undefeatable piece of ordinance. Um, finally, though, it came to a climax. As my daughter, who was a few years older than her brother, yelled as they came out sort of from, uh, you know, their hands behind their back, tsunami with a triumphant look on her face. Meanwhile, meanwhile, my son Atticus, named for Atticus Finch, in case anybody's wondering, was sitting opposite her and was just silently waving his arms back and forth. Mystified, we asked him what that was supposed to represent, and he replied with even greater smugness and triumph than his sister, God. <laughs> that was it, game over. There was nothing left to say, no more game to play. Well, in the realm of revealed religious truth, there is a danger that when adherents invoke God's revealed truth, they think that means the game is over. There is nothing left to discuss. Even more alarming, some may feel a duty to compel obedience to God's revelation by any means necessary, and they consider it an act of supreme virtue to do so. It makes me think of the chilling quote from Robespierre, he of the reign of terror in revolutionary France, when he said, first comes virtue, and then its emanation, terror. Indeed. And I'm just going to insert here parenthetically that if we look over the scope of history, we can see that this conviction of the absolute rightness of a position is not a perspective that is limited to those who come to the debate from a religious perspective. Um, whether it was uh, Robespierre of the Reign of Terror in France, whether it was the horrific abuses in China during the communist era under Stalin, um, this same um, potentially violent absolutism born out of claims of, of absolute truth can be found in either the secular or the religious arenas. We are seeing this sort of religious radicalization now in many parts of the world, and it has certainly been seen many, many times in history. During the period from 1618 to 1648, much of Europe was ravaged by the brutal Thirty Years' War, which began as a religious war. And by some estimates, this was shocking to me, truly shocking, led to eight million deaths across the continent. Try to wrap your mind around that, going back over 400 years. The devastation was so great that it ultimately prompted the establishment of a radical new political order in Europe, referred to as the Peace of Westphalia, which established actually our modern concept of a sovereign state, as well as the beginning of a more tolerant attitude toward religious diversity. The Enlightenment accelerated this move by the West toward embracing a separate, individual, and to some degree subordinate role for religion in civil society and with it, a more settled acceptance of religious tolerance and its companion, religious freedom. 
This was perhaps most effectively achieved in the United States with our historically unique and very bold idea to provide for both the separation of church and state and, very importantly, and the unfettered free exercise of religion. And I would argue that this extraordinary combination has been sort of the secret sauce that has made our American experiment so remarkably successful. Thus, I think we can acknowledge that religion has enormous potential to be a great tonic in society, building character and imparting virtue, and above all, giving meaning and direction to the lives of its adherents. But we also can acknowledge that there is a risk implicit in the absolute truth claims of religion that can lead to intolerance and radicalization. So how do we ensure that religious freedom safeguards the conscience and convictions of all, but restrains the impulse of some to become the enforcers of God's will on earth? How can we help religion to be a tonic and not a toxin in our body politic? I'd like to suggest a few answers. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, and my husband and I are full of James Madison today because we uh, were able to sneak away for a few hours to go to Montpelier where we really just had a, a, an incredibly fascinating um, sort of uh, crash course in, in um, Madison's work um, as father of the Constitution and also in the cross currents and contradictions and hypocrisies in his life proclaiming um, our most cherished fundamental freedoms and creating the framework to protect them all the while um, holding uh, other human beings as his slave and property and freeing not a single one of them in his entire lifetime and not at his death either. But James Madison, the father of the Constitution, believed that religious pluralism was essential to protecting our civic rights. And if we can accept the need for this pluralism, this multiplicity of religious voices and religious faith communities, it is a powerful, powerful antidote to the dangers of absolutism. Voltaire said, with typical Voltairean insight, when there is only one religion, tyranny rules. When there are two, religious war reigns. When there are many, liberty comes. Second, when we speak about defending freedom of religion, we must conceptualize it not only in terms of protecting people's right to have their beliefs and to exercise their beliefs, but also their right to access the public square where ideas are exchanged and debated on the basis of equality and respect. Protecting religious freedom must mean defending the public arena itself. Our duty is to defend not just the players on the field, but the turf as well. Third, we have to acknowledge that while broad accommodation should and indeed must under our Constitution be made for the legitimate demands that faith imposes on its adherents, sometimes religious practice will have to conform to our earthly laws and standards of justice, not because we place man's law above God's, but because we have the civic humility to recognize our own inadequacy in knowing how God would have his laws applied. This idea is well illustrated in one of my favorite works of literature, Robert Bolt's famous play, A Man for All Seasons, about Sir Thomas More. Now I know that um, in recent years, the books by Hilary Mantle have painted a, a radically different portrait of Sir Thomas More, and, um, and so we won't engage in a debate tonight about, you know, will the real Thomas More please stand up? Um, but for purposes of my remarks this evening, we are going to focus on the character um, as portrayed, the, the actual historical figure, as portrayed uh, by Thomas Bolt. In Bolt's depiction, we follow Moore as he tries to navigate the terrain between man's laws and God's laws and his ultimate duty to each. Now, 
I brought my very, very well-worn copy of the play with me. As you can see, it is more or less falling apart. And um, it's not quite a book of scripture to me, but I hold it near and dear, um, and I have gained many profound insights from reading and rereading this play. My kids keep offering, they say, Mom, can we get you a new copy of that? I say, absolutely not. This... These, uh, you know, these pages hold more than just the words on them now. They hold a little bit of me for the many times I have read them and communed with them. Um, and I'd like to, to read you two passages from two very different moments in, in Robert Moore's uh, journey. Uh, in one, we will see Sir Thomas More seeking the protection a protection he very much wants in the thickets of man's laws. And in the second, we see him ready to pay the ultimate price to be faithful to God's laws. Now, um, I do think probably most of you know the story of Sir Thomas More, but I'll, I'll sort of set the stage before I do my dramatic reading here. Um, he was the Lord Chancellor to King Henry VIII of England, who had, was a man of great appetites in all things in life, including um, love. And uh, he had been married for some years to Catherine uh, of Aragon, who did not, and they were not ha able to have a child again. And he fell in love with a beautiful young woman, Anne Boleyn, and wanted to marry her and requested a divorce from the Pope. But Catherine, uh, uh, you know, her... Uh, nation and her family had very close ties to the papacy and they would not and she of course did not want to be divorced and so the divorce would not be granted and this led ultimately um, to the decision uh, by Henry VIII to break from the church um, in Rome and to establish the Church of England with himself as the head of the church and Sir Thomas More was a very devout Catholic and he could not countenance this and so he resigned as Lord Chancellor and and retired to his country home, quite content and hoping to sort of keep his head down and, and um, be able to keep his, his integrity and his convictions, but perhaps um, stay out of the gaze of a very capricious and very dangerous monarch. But uh, it was not to be quite that easy. And we find him in this scene being approached by a very ambitious uh, young climber, uh, who is, is desperate for employment and has come to Sir Thomas More asking him to employ him. His name is, uh, is Richard Rich. And Thomas has a, a conversation with him and he won't give him a job. And he um, doesn't trust him and he, he refuses to sort of take him under his patronage. And uh, he leaves. And Sir Thomas More's family, including his wife and his soon-to-be son-in-law, are very, very alarmed that this person, who has now been rebuffed, could become a grave threat to Thomas More. And so, um, as he leaves, they watch him go. And Sir Thomas More's son-in-law, future son-in-law, Roper, says to him, arrest him. And his wife says, yes. And More says, for what? And his wife said, he's dangerous for libel. He's a spy. He is. Arrest him. His daughter says, father, that man's bad. And Moore replies, there's no law against that. And his son-in-law says, there is a law against that. God's law. And Sir Thomas More replies, then God can arrest him. Sophistication upon sophistication. No, Roper, sheer simplicity. The law, Roper, the law. I know what's legal, not what's right, and I'll stick to what's legal. Then his son-in-law asks him, Then you set man's law above God's? Oh, no, far below. But let me draw your attention to a fact. I'm not God. The currents and eddies of right and wrong which you find such plain sailing, I can't navigate. I'm no voyager. But in the thickets of the law, oh, oh, there I'm a forester. I doubt if there's a man alive who could follow me there. Thank God. 
And then his wife, in an exas exasperated tone, says, and while you talk, he's gone. And go he should, if he was the devil himself, until he broke the law. So now you would give the devil benefit of the law? Yes, I would. What would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? His son-in-law responds, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. More, now roused and excited, says, oh. And when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper, the laws all being flat? This country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I give the devil benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. So at this point, in this sort of conflict, if you will, between what his son-in-law is asserting is the morally right thing to do. That man's dangerous. He means you ill. He's a spy. Come to, to put you in a compromising situation. Sir Thomas More absolutely stands by earthly law. He says, I'm going to give him the benefit of the law until he breaks it. No finger can be laid upon him. And those laws need to be upheld for all of our benefit, they provide us protection. How do we stand in the winds that blow if we think we can mow them down to achieve some imagined moral purpose? But when we next, in my rendition, many things transpire in the interim, meet Sir Thomas More, his hope to, to retire in quiet, quietude to the country um, has not succeeded. And, and Henry cannot abide this man who is so respected, who is known as a man of integrity, refusing to take an oath that all have been required to take, acknowledging him as the legitimate head of the church. And so we next find Sir Thomas More in the tower um, awaiting trial on treason. And his beloved daughter, Margaret, um, and... Uh, the same fellow Roper, who is by now his son-in-law, and his wife um, come to see him in the tower. And he is thrilled after many long and lonely months in this bitter cold place to see them. So there they are talking. And Roper, once again, I would have liked to have met Roper. He seems like a rather impetuous, slightly unbearable, but good-hearted son-in-law. Um, and he says to him, Sir, Come out, swear to the act, take the oath, and come out. And Moore responds, is that why they let you come? Yes, Meg, his daughter, is under oath to persuade you. Moore, that was silly, Meg. How did you come to do that? Oh, I wanted to. You want me to swear to the act of succession. She responds, God more regards the thoughts of the heart than the words of the mouth, or so you've always told me. Yes, that's true. Then say the words of the oath, and in your heart think otherwise. But what is an oath, then, but words that we say to God? Well, that's very neat. Do you mean it isn't true? No, it's true. Well then, it's a poor argument to call it neat, Meg. When a man takes an oath, Meg, he's holding his own self in his own hands like water. And if he opens his fingers then, he needn't hope to find himself again. In Moore's heroic determination to hold his own self in his own hands and not to open his fingers, even for the sake of his own safety or freedom. I hear echoes of my own young father, 
holding tight to his soul's integrity, no matter the cost. Finally, perhaps the greatest protection we can offer to the rights of conscience is to embrace a theology that teaches that it is, above all, God's desire that his children should be free to choose for themselves. This profound, sublime truth is there in the teachings of all the great faiths of the world, although sometimes it seems to be hidden in plain sight. It is there in the Quran, which instructs that there is to be no compulsion in religion. It is there in both the Old and New Testaments, and it is abundant and even central to the teachings of the namesake of this distinguished lecture, Joseph Smith, whose revelations and writings about our individual free agency give unprecedented power, sovereignty, and dignity to each of us individually, and it does so as a central feature of God's plan for humanity's salvation and happiness. In the words of a popular Latter-day Saint hymn, Know this, that every soul is free to choose his life and what he'll be. For this eternal truth is given that God will force no man to heaven. And so I would like to close tonight with a last story that I think beautifully illustrates the profound connection between religious freedom and all the other precious rights that we cherish and underscores that actualizing those rights depends on our individual right to seek truth for ourselves. John Wycliffe, the English philosopher, theologian, reformer, and preacher, undertook to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into the common vernacular in the late 1300s. And he did so in the face of enormous opposition and even persecution from the ecclesiastical authorities of his day. Despite all, he persisted in this mission. And when his work was done, he wrote the following words in the flyleaf of that first Bible. The translation is complete and shall make possible government of the people by the people, and for the people. Now, we all associate those immortal words with President Lincoln and the occasion of the Gettysburg Address, but they have a much more ancient patrimony. We cannot know precisely what Wycliffe meant when he wrote those words, but I believe he was illuminating for all of us the profound insight that, men went, that when men and women are free to pursue and understand truth for themselves without compulsion, they become empowered to build societies that honor the claims of conscience and the fundamental liberties of all people. May we use our God-given liberty to do that, is my prayer. Thank you very much. I should have told you this was coming, but I, I think you know it's now your opportunity to engage Dr. Lantos Sweat with your questions about anything she said um, or anything you heard in my introduction of her. And if someone's ready now, I'm ready to defer to you. Is there a question? And my friend Brian Johnson has a microphone if anyone's ready. Yes, all right, then I'll save my question and <laughs> defer to the floor. Hi. Just so you all know, this young man is kind of like my son-in-law because he's the brother of my new son-in-law. So. <laughs> so you better be nice to me. <laughs> OK. Um, so I have kind of a hard question. You want to put the switch on the mic? Is it on? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, so one of the great sort of legal struggles, I have a legal background, so that's where my interest comes from. Uh, but one of the great legal struggles in this area is figuring out what exactly counts as a religious belief that should be protected. And you mentioned that um, sometimes when it comes to religious practices, there may be a point at which we need to subordinate our, our practices to the civil law in a sense of civic humility. Is there or should there be a point in which uh, we should subordinate religious teachings and promote that kind of practice in a similar sense of civic humility that well, maybe we don't understand this perfectly? Um, because traditionally, that's not an area we're comfortable with restricting. Well. It's a, it's a fantastic question and, um, and a very sophisticated one, but I think it's one that actually has a relatively simple answer. I think the answer is no, that we um, should not, uh, um, I, I, it is hard to imagine the circumstances under which it would be appropriate for the government to seek to interfere in the teachings um, and the theological beliefs and the desire to pass along those teachings and beliefs to members of a faith community. So I would say that in, in some senses, I think the answer is a pretty clear no. Uh, but I, I might take a moment to elaborate a little further on what I was talking about when I said that there are occasions when we may find that a particular religious practice has to um, be considered and be weighed against uh, civic law and and um, the rules of the road in the society that we share with lots of other people. Uh, we see that happening with a lot of frequency now as some really, really tough issues continue to roil our society, uh, where we see on the one hand really rapidly expanding definitions of, um, of, uh, of what constitute fundamental civil rights and who, um, what communities, what individuals, what uh, folks need to be brought into the full protection of our, of our civil rights. And some of those expanding boundaries bump up against religious teachings, bump up against the sincere and profoundly held beliefs and convictions of people of faith. And so we are seeing through the courts, and my prediction for what it's worth is that we will continue to see through the courts a lot of litigation probably for you know the next quarter century as we try to try to figure it out and as we try to, to map out what is the landscape going forward and how do we balance those things. I will say, and it shows in a way how divided we've become as a society, not that long ago in, uh, in the um, 1990s in response to a Supreme Court decision um, that uh, many members of Congress felt unduly restricted religious practices of uh, certain members of Native American tribes, I believe it was in the context of prison, the Congress passed almost unanimously, almost unanimously, um, a piece of legislation called RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which established basically how, as a society, we would balance competing religious claims um, when they ran afoul of, um, of laws, um, otherwise neutral laws on our books. and. Uh, the, the essential balance that Congress proposed was, um, first of all, that before the government could restrict a religious practice, they had to meet the highest level of governmental interest. So they had to show that they had a compelling government interest. It couldn't be, you know, this is desirable, this is a policy we'd like to pursue, but it had to be a compelling government interest. And then um, they had to demonstrate that the restriction that that compelling government interest justified imposing on religious practice was tailored as narrowly as possible. So on the one hand, government has to meet a high bar in saying, we are going to interfere with your you know, beliefs and, and the way you act on them because we have a compelling interest and the way in which we do so, we will make the impact as minimal as possible. It was passed, pretty good law. Some states passed their own RIFRAs. That kind of law has now become wildly controversial. So it kind of is a little one of many vignettes we could look at that show us in a way how, um, how we have had a, a decline in, in sort of the, the center space in our politics and we have had a, a diminution of our ability to um, kind of come together with goodwill to figure out how we re resolve issues. Anyway, good question, thank you. I can't believe I answered every question. 
There's somebody back there. So I believe it was during the second English administration, the first lady gave a speech where she talked about the American responsibility to save Muslim women who were seen as oppressed. And I'm wondering to what extent should the government or just citizens step in when someone is willingly submitting to a religion but don't seem to have the education to know that they are oppressed or aren't living up to their goal? You know, it's, it's another excellent question. Um, I think that, that it, it, it's a difficult one. Um, but both under our constitutional law and under international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are certain rights you have that are um, non-derogable. They can't be derogated. By that, it, what we mean is that you can't even voluntarily in this country say, I want to be a slave. You can't do it. It is not lawful in our country to be a slave. And um, one can argue that, well, that's sort of overriding in a way your free will, but that's the decision we have made as a society, that certain things are out of bounds. Um, you know, in, uh, in international law, there's this whole uh, you know, list of fundamental human rights, universal human rights that are cataloged in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And many of them, um, the, the um, UD, the Universal Declaration, permits for, um, you know, a temporary derogation of those rights, um, a suspension of those rights in, you know, certain exigent circumstances, national emergencies, in the case of, um, you know, uh, an epidemic, you know, you can think of circumstances, but there's a handful of rights that are non-derogable. You can never um, have a right, for example, to institute torture. That's one of those very, very, you know, essential rights that's at the very core of human dignity, and no government can ever legitimately say, oh, we now need to torture. It's not permitted under the Universal Declaration. And so I think um, in trying to answer your question, Obviously, it's a, it's a spectrum. There are a range of things um, that uh, may be encouraged. They may be theologically required within certain um, sects of the, of, you know, the large and, and very diverse Muslim faith community um, that might seem restrictive, might ruffle um, our sort of feathers in terms of women's equality but that I think we would have to show a, a degree of respect and, and deference to. But there are other practices that must be, in my view, declared outside the pale. And let me give you three examples. And these are examples of some of the most egregious abuses that um, Muslim women in some countries have been subjected to. The first is female genital mutilation. Um, I have no problem whatsoever um, saying that, that the world should declare that outside the bounds. No culture and no religion can be used to justify um, this uh, torture and uh, abuse of um, typically young girls. Um, the second is child marriage. That is, again, something that I think the world can just sort of come together and say it may have happened in the past. We, uh, we, do, we pass no um, retroactive judgment on the mores and standards and practices of you know, centuries past, but we say now, in the year 2017, this is outside the bounds, and children cannot be married off by their parents. Um, and that's finished, full stop, period. And the third, of course, which should need no explanation, is honor killings, um, which is, you know, something that is, again, frighteningly common, where uh, girls, young girls, or not such young girls, who are in some way perceived to have stained the family honor um, by failing to maintain uh, an accepted level of purity in, in some sense, um, that the only way to expiate that stain on the family's honor is for that uh, individual to be killed. So I think we have to have the courage of our own convictions. Sometimes um, when we run up or bump up against fanaticism from any quarter, um, the problem is that it's precisely the very reasonable people who are sort of trying to counter that. And in their very reasonableness and broad-mindedness and desire to be 
full of understanding and full of humility about other ways of looking at things, are not prepared to stand up with the courage of our convictions and say there are certain fundamental protections that every human being is entitled to. And if your religious beliefs, um, you know, countenance invading those fundamental rights, then, that, then, then society is not going to permit that. And, and so I, I think that's how we have to, to deal with it. Um, and, uh, and I also think, and this is something I teach human rights at Tufts University, and you know, I run through a list of the attributes of human rights for my students, and um, one of the very important ones is they are individual. Your bundle of rights belongs to you and to you and to you, not you as a this or you as a member of that group, but to you individually. And we always have to be very sensitive to the uh, pressures that can be placed on young women or other vulnerable populations in a community where they, um, the expectations and the, uh, and the social strictures on them are such that it's difficult for them to be able to honestly say, yes, I wish to do this. Yes, this is my choice. So those are my thoughts on that. Good question. Given your, your last comment um, um, about kind of individual rights and individuality and other religious freedom, and in response to the last question, you talked about kind of the controversial, you know, the way in which religious freedom is up. I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about um, if you have any insights based on the research and teaching of human rights about the relationship between the individual, like who is the object of the religious freedom, right? And thinking particularly, like there's a difference between the Colorado situation and the Cape Bay versus Hobby Lobby and the, the, the religious right conferred to a corporation. And I'm wondering just what kind of historical research or human rights research do you have any insights to offer on that kind of front? Well, you know, I, I think we're all sort of in the position of stay tuned because as I say, as it relates to a lot of these emerging religious freedom cases, that are making their way to the Supreme Court, there is going to be a new body of Supreme Court jurisprudence coming forth, and we're going to all be reading it and trying to understand it and study it. The Hobby Lobby case, you know, a very interesting one, controversial, certainly. Are most of you familiar with what she's referring to? I, I see mainly nodding heads. Um, you're right, I think it was controversial in part because the court extended um, conscience rights to what we think of as a corporation, and it is a big corporation. I mean, they have many thousands of employees and a large number of stores around the world. It's not a publicly held corporation. This was one of the factors that the court relied upon in reaching their decision. The court um, also, as I recall, um, relied upon the fact that the religious convictions of the owners of this um, business were not peripheral to their business but central to their business. So they talked about different ways in which they had chosen to integrate their faith life with their business life. Um, you know, they weren't open on Sundays. I, you know, believe there were, you know, certain products they didn't sell. Um, and uh, and um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, they had sort of statements of their faith that were prominently displayed in their places of business. So the court felt that this was um, a deep and sincerely held conviction. I think the other critical factor, if I'm not mistaken, and again, I didn't really come prepared to give a, you know, a, a full legal exegesis on, on that case, but it was a narrowly um, construed opinion because I believe the court held that while the government might have, and it was a RIFRA case, it was a religious freedom Act case, that while the government may have a compelling interest in seeing that, you know, all women are treated equally in terms of their access to the full range of birth control, this was not the only means available for the government to achieve that goal. So you remember that one of the RIFRA um, requirements was that if you are going to impinge on the religious freedom of um, somebody, and in this case of a, of a company, you have to do it in, in the way that 
is most na narrowly tailored. You can't broadly say, oh, we have a compelling interest so we can do whatever we want. You have to try and figure out the least um, impinging way to achieve that governmental purpose. And I think the court basically ruled there are other ways the government can do this. They have a lot of other options for making sure that those women employed there who want access to the, it was a couple of methods of birth control that they didn't um, include in their in their health care plan because they were abortifacients and that violated their religious beliefs. So the, the court basically said, there's another way you can do this. But you're right, the, the really controversial part was, whoa, conscience rights for a business? Does that make sense? And, um, and uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't see any likely challenge to Hobby Lobby coming down the pike. So yes, I think that's now the law that under the circumstances in a fact, um, Set of a set of facts similar to that, the court might rule that way again. Um, so, hope that helps. Yes. Thank you. So, in the most recent U.S. election, we saw a surprise a lot of us with this backlash against this sense of entitlement and elitism um, that seemed to come from. A, So it made me wonder, is there a non-state solution to radicals? Something that will bring people who have felt marginalized by, and by what they may feel as state overreach in terms of tolerance and inclusion, a way that we can bring them back from a person-to-person -person standpoint that reduces that radicalization. It's something that you know, kind of happened here in the States, but also in Muslim countries where they're facing the same thing with marginalized well, you know, it's, it's a really good question. It's an important question. And I, I think that the answer is yes. But I think that because of the magnitude, just, just the magnitude of society and the magnitude of sort of the, the um, divisions we see in society, it's perhaps a little naive, a little Pollyannish to say, well, you know, one by one, you know, person to person, we can make this all right because things are on sort of a big scale and so much is driven by these kind of flash mobs on Twitter and on social media and all of that. But I still think it's, it's possible, but I think that we have to become more creative about how we how we make that personal breakthrough on a larger scale. And I'm going to give you an example that perhaps not everybody in this audience may be comfortable with. So I'm using it for illustrative purposes. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get into an argument about the underlying um, political cause that was being promoted. But just sort of as a tactic, I want to talk about something that I think was effective. OK, so, so I don't want anybody to get upset and say, well, why were you talking about that? Um, in some states and in some jurisdictions where members of the LGBT community were trying to get legislation adopted or rulings overturned that had to do with same-sex marriage. And, and those had, you know, they, there was a long string of defeats on those kinds of issues for the LGBTQ community. And then, you know, things sort of changed and they began winning some of those battles. And again, I'm not trying, I don't want to get into that fight. I'm talking tactics here. But what um, people from that community sort of came to realize as they strategized for themselves, how do we break through? How do we, you know, make this, a, a, you know, an effective way of reaching out to our neighbors that they needed, frankly, to stop talking about their interpretation of the Constitution and whether the Equal Protection Clause did or didn't and whether the founders of the Constitution would have ever contemplated, you know, same-sex marriage or whatever the issue was and instead decided to pursue campaigns that were very focused on telling their stories and, and transforming them from the other, you know, the exotic or maybe the disliked or maybe the judged other into sort of people that, that others who, you know, might have strong religious views, but nonetheless they began to say, oh, you know, that, I, I can relate to that person. I can relate to the struggles of their life, and they aren't 
that different from me? So I bring that example up because I think it illustrates that while I don't think you can kind of solve things one-on-one, -on -one, I really don't, <laughs> you know, I mean, I just want to be realistic. It's a big world. This is a big country, more than 300 million people. And there are just so many forces that, yes, you can within your family, within your community, within your school, with, you know, but writ large, I don't see that working. But we can try to craft campaigns and strategies that take that effort to, to personalize the people we disagree with. So that, you know, coming from the democratic side of the aisle, we don't dismiss um, people as a basket of deplorables. And I'm going to go on record, I was a Hillary Clinton supporter. This is, you know, I'm not saying that to target her for criticism. But that's an example of really otherizing a lot of people and dismissing them. That we don't um, refer to undocumented immigrants in this country in language that seems to suggest that the vast majority of them are criminals and rapists and, you know, here to do, you know, wreak mayhem on our otherwise peaceful communities. Um, we are now in the midst of a, of a discussion and a, uh, I hope a successful one that's going to take place in the next five months about whether or not we want legislatively to provide protection for the so-called dreamers, um, young people who were brought here without any say-so by their parents, and this is, uh, but they don't have, you know, legal status. Um, this is the only country they've ever known. This is the language they speak. This is where their lives are, and there's a lot of sympathy that, um, that you know, we probably could and should find a, a path for them. And I think, again, it's the personal dimension of their story writ large that gives everybody a lot more hope that at least that little piece of the immigration puzzle can be solved because everybody says, well, my gosh, what if that had been me? What if I was six years old and living on the other side of the border and, to, you know, try and improve our lives? My parents brought me here. It would be horrible now in adulthood to suddenly be kicked out of the only home I've ever known. So, so I think personalizing is the answer, avoiding the otherizing, finding that common ground, building, building those bridges. But one has to find bigger ways to do it. And the other thing I would say is it, in my view, also does take leadership from the top. It really does. Um, whether you like or don't like the person who happens to be president of the United States at any given moment, when they enunciate about things, it does have an enormous, um, you know, not even trickle down, rush down effect on the rest of society. Um, again, going back to, you know, uh, hot controversies and topics, we saw a dramatic and incredibly rapid shift in public opinion about issues around same-sex marriage and some of these tough issues when the president sort of announced that, you know, he had evolved on this issue and had changed his point of view. So I think leadership from the top is hugely influential, even though in this country we mainly like to bash our leaders. I mean, you know, that's sort of the national pastime and, um, and, and good for us, you know. It keep, we don't want any kings and it's, a, you know, it's not a bad thing to, to knock them off their pedestals every, every couple of days because, you know, it's, uh, you know it's, it's just part of our DNA, our political DNA. But, um, but having said that, nonetheless, I still think that what we get from the very top influences the tenor of society, for good or for ill. And so we need both. We need efforts to, you know, create the personal narrative and, and get good leadership from the top. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, I have a similar question, but it dealt more with how your conclusions can be implemented in U.S. foreign policy. Um, how do you suggest that the U.S. can promote values of pluralism when historically attempts to either unintentionally or intentionally uh, disseminate Western values into other cultures has often led to uh, accusations of cultural imperialism that often tend to fuel these uh, more intolerant religious fundamentalisms? Is it the same solution of personalization, or do you suggest something else? Another excellent question. Um, I don't think it's the same solution of personalization. And I'm going to push back just a little bit on the notion that we are trying to export Western values. These ideas, um, this you know, sort of 
uh, mindset of pluralism, protection for conscience rights, and then a whole bunch of additional fundamental human rights. They may have emerged first in terms of you know being formulated kind of out of the Enlightenment and, and in that sense are maybe thought of as you know sort of a, a Western creation. But one of the things that I, I do when I teach this course on human rights and American foreign policy, we spend part of the first lecture looking at all of the tributaries from a whole range of cultures and especially faith traditions um, that have sort of come together to form this mighty river that constitutes the modern human rights movement. And so, and, and I would also say, for those of you who want to read a great book about the drafting of the Universal Declaration, um, it's called A World Made New, written by Marianne Glendon. She um, is the learned hand professor of law at Harvard Law School, and I got to know her quite well. We were colleagues um, on the commission together for four years, and she's a, a marvelous and wonderful woman, but she's written a beautiful book. It almost reads like a novel, and you'll just feel good after you read it, um, about the drafting of the Universal Declaration and Eleanor Roosevelt's role in it. But one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that the core group of drafters um, did represent a variety of cultures. You know, there was a Professor Chang, this absolutely brilliant Chinese scholar, and um, a Professor Malik from Lebanon. And uh, you had, um, you know, a, a variety of people from a variety of perspectives. It wasn't just, you know, a, a monocultural product that emerged. And, um, and I really feel that the rights secured, I mean, tonight we're talking about religious freedom, but that broader uh, brief of rights that I think of as the, the core universal human rights, everybody wants them. I have not met anyone in any culture of any gender who doesn't want them for themselves. And to me, that supports and sustains the claim to universality. And those who put forth the argument of cultural imperialism and cultural relativism, in my experience, have usually been those who are seeking to, um, to resist reform in their society, resist modernization, resist the opening up of that space. But now to your other question, so how do we, um, how do, we do a better job in our foreign policy? To me, the answer is actually quite simple. We prioritize. Um, international religious freedom. We have a bad habit in our foreign policy of we have this beautifully wrapped package called human rights, religious freedom, whatever you want to call it. And it's lovely. It looks like, just looks gorgeous. And every, you know, three or four months, we sort of bring it out and we put it on the table and, you know, we issue a little statement. And then it's very quickly taken um, away and put in a little closet and kind of locked up because we don't actually want those values, those soft, you know, value things to interfere with the tough, hard business of, uh, you know, sort of managing our foreign policy in a, in a big, bad world. I think it's a big mistake. I think we make a terrible mistake when we marginalize and diminish the centrality of advancing our core values as a key part of our foreign policy. Because guess what? When we help others to create their own societies that are tolerant, that are pluralistic, that do make space in the public arena for a wide range of, of religious confessions and, and beliefs and a whole bunch of other things, we are helping others to build societies that will stand the test of time. When we don't, when we don't, we are just kicking the can down the road. And those societies will become um, sources of threat to us. If you take a, a list of the countries that right now pose the greatest national security, nothing's more you know, hard-edged and realpolitik than our national security, but if you take the list of the countries that pose the greatest threat to our um, national security, I, I can promise you that, I'll say almost just because it's safer to say almost, but almost every last one of them are countries that are religious right abusers, religious freedom abusers, human rights abusers, almost to a one. Now, it may also be true that we have allies 
that are also in that category. But, um, but that does not justify and that does not excuse um, us failing to sort of promote and advance our values. I think you always want to lead from your strengths. You know, what is our great strength? What's the difference maker? What is it that we think, and I still think, has made America something different in the course and the sweep of human history? It's our values. And it's that we led with our values and that we cared about them. And um, so I, I really think that the answer is that it has to have a higher priority. And not because, because we can do so much more concrete if we make it a higher priority. You're right, there are limits. And you know, we're not gonna go to war over religious freedom. We're not gonna, you know, we, there's only so much we can do to change the facts on the ground in other sovereign countries. But when we speak out decisively and with passion and with commitment in defense of those values and in support of those in other societies who are trying very often at great risk to themselves to advance those values, we empower them. We give them strength. Um, you know, there were a lot of arguments many years ago um, when the Congress adopted something called the jackson vanik Amendment, which was intended to sort of punish the Soviet Union for not allowing Jewish citizens to emigrate to Israel. And, you know, you had at that time the, the Nixon administration followed by the Ford administration saying, well, this will actually make things worse for people there. We want to do it through quiet diplomacy. But the people themselves who were being held prisoner, they said, no, we want this because it puts America on the record. It says to our leaders that what they're doing is wrong. And that empowers us. It was the same thing when our Congress tried to pass and successfully passed over President Reagan's veto, the South Africa Sanctions Bill. Again, the administration said, we want to work through quiet diplomacy. You know, This will hurt the very people we want to help in South Africa. And it was the African-American community and people in South Africa um, said, no, we want this. It doesn't matter if it hurts us a little bit in the short run, because what it does is it puts the world's most powerful democracy on record as saying, what you're doing is wrong, and we condemn it, and we criticize it, and we disassociate ourselves from it, and we want you to pay a price for it. So the biggest impact when we stand by our values and when we promote them is the way that we empower people in their own countries to be brave and to stand up and to take on the fights that ultimately only they can win. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for the quality of your questions. I'm sure that Dr. Lanto Sweat feels like she's had a workout. <laughs> and and I, you have done UVA proud and this community. I thank you for that. I am struck by the sweep of your questions and, and the depth of issues that they invited um, Dr. Lanto Sweat to. I thank you, Dr. Lanto Sweat, for being equal to that. And uh, my, my personal view is that um, good presentations not only give you answers, and, and I appreciate the, the uh, commitment that was expressed here today, uh, but they also give us very good questions. And I hope you will return to this lecture series for more such extraordinary commentary on religious liberty. So thank you very much, and I hope you'll enjoy talking to each other about these issues. But again, let's thank Dr. Katrina Lampostek. <laughs>